Right now, 2.3 billion humans are living in poverty. 2.3 billion, that's one third of human population. 2.3 billion can be defined either being extreme poor or moderately poor. 900 million individuals live in extreme poverty and the remainder is so-called moderately poor. If you are defined being a person living in poverty, the definition basically is a claim to the amount of money you are able to spend per day. According to the World Bank today, we are talking an average of 1.9 to 2.5 US dollars a day in order to pay for your nutrition, pay for your food, pay for your education, pay for medical care, and also pay for your housing. If you have access to $2.5 a day, you will never ever be able to save any money, you will never ever be able to invest any money and to build your own future. It's not only about numbers, it's actually about faces, because that's what we, we read the newspapers, we always see the large numbers, but what we need to understand, 2.3 billion individuals are individual faces with stories, with families, with kids, with fathers, with desires, with hopes, with anxieties. So what I tried to do initially, I tried to spend a lot of time trying to talk, trying to listen, trying to understand what are the real needs of poor people today. And I spent bulk of my time in so-called frontier markets or emerging markets, where I usually don't wear a nice suit as I, de as I do today. I uh, spent my time somewhere on the road in a pretty miserable hotel usually, and trying to fight my way together with my colleagues, uh, but to meeting people. Africa is an example, you might know, Today in Africa, 130 million children and kids are in the age group of getting access to schools and universities. Out of this number, however, only 50 million are actually provided schooling and education, and the reminder has no access. They are excluded from any hope, from any chance to actually visit a school and go and study. This is a picture in Cameroon. I'm not teaching here. I was just taught a French lesson here, because Cameroon, as you know, is French-speaking. Now, poverty, we need to understand. If you're poor, you can be homeless, or you actually live in huts without roofs, you've got no heating, you're exposed to nature. 70% of the population today has no access, still no access, to piped water. Medical care is a disaster. If you are a mother, if you are receiving a child, the likelihood of maternal to death is extremely high. And one third of the population today still has no access to any recognized identity, has no access to any electricity. And keep in mind, without electricity, it gets pretty dark at night. And it gets dark starting at 5, 6 p.m. in the evening. The only alternative is using kerosene. Kerosene is absolute disaster. It brings a lot of illness. And lastly, poverty also has got to do having no access to any banking facility. Because only if you have got an access to a bank facility, you might be granted a loan, you might can ask for a credit. But if you are excluded from the banking system, you will not be given the opportunity to participate in the society we all live in today. Now, in order to understand how you can actually fight poverty, and all of you know, you know, we have been deploying billions of US dollars in development aid over the last decades. As of today, this is still the situation. Development aid has reached certain goals, has fulfilled certain objectives, but the poor, poor level we are seeing today is still disastrous. The recent Nobel Prize winner, uh, Angus Deaton, he actually calls development aid the, the modern colonialism. And there are other very important uh, people out there doing a lot of research. They believe aid actually kills. And I want to show you now why I personally believe, together with my colleagues working together with me, how besides actually providing pure development aid, you can really fight poverty. Nelson Mandela, poverty is not an accident. Like slavery and apartheid, it's man-made 
and can be removed by the actions of human beings. Poverty is man-made. Mohamed Yunus, former Nobel Prize winner and founder of the Grameen Bank, we have created a society that does not allow opportunities for those people to take care of themselves because we have denied them those opportunities to take care of themselves. That is not what aid is about, but what impact investing, for example, and microfinance and providing credits to individuals, that is basically providing aid and help to individuals to really work with their own perspectives and helping themselves. It's all about including the excluded. How can we include 2.3 billion individuals in our society, in our financial systems? And please don't be misunderstood. People today who are excluded in the system, they have got one desire, they have got one hope. They want to become included. That is so important. If you are starving, if you've got five children sitting beside you, and you, have get, you generate no income, and you've got really difficulties to survive, the only wish and the only dream you have and ambition is to make that next step, to become included in society and in system. You want to help, you want to send your children to education, you want to pay the medical care for your grandfather, etc. So it's all about how to make people included, how to push them into inclusion. That is what microfinance is actually all about, and impact investing. Because if you are poor, most likely you have got no access to any capital. Just imagine yourself, you know, if you were to live in a poor country, let's take Cambodia as an example, 50% of all the people living in Cambodia are so-called poor. If you are Cambodian and you would like to develop and create an own business and help your family, you want to buy, you want to sell, you want to produce. For all of these factors, you are going to need some money. You need some investment. You're going to need to buy a couple of pineapples. If you're in Cambodia, you actually can buy pineapples and you can sell them with a margin of 25%. But you need to have some money to buy 50 pineapples. Somebody needs to give you $50 in order for you to take them along you know, go, go from one village to the next village and sell your pineapples with a margin to make some profits. If you do not have any cash, you will never be able to buy a pineapple. So you need some money, and it's small money. If you ask your friends and family, you will not receive any funding because most likely your friends and family will be poor as well. You obviously can go to a bank. There are lots of banks in frontier markets. Some of you probably have seen them who travel a lot. The problem is banks will only provide you money for collateral, for guarantee. But since you're poor, you've got no access to any collateral. You cannot pledge anything. There's nothing you have in your hands. So a bank is not going to help you. You can go and see a so-called shark lender. A shark lender most likely is going to provide you with some money. But research actually shows for the last 15 years that the default rate by receiving a funding by a shark lender is close to 90%. There's no way you will ever pay back that loan. So the only other opportunity you have is you're going to see a so-called microfinance institution. And a microfinance institution is going to give you a loan without collateral. It's going to be small initially. This can be a loan of $50. In India, for example, the average we, we provide is 50 to 60 US dollars. It can be a thousand dollars in Southeast Asia, and it can be up to two or three thousand dollars in Central Asia, for example. But they're all very small loans. And it's a loan, it's a business. A loan needs to be paid back, that's very important. And there's always an interest rate tucked together with the loan, so it's a business. So you provide money and accessibility to an individual who actually gets the opportunity to develop himself. You become a business partner of a poor people who has no other opportunity in life. Impact investing is very different from traditional investing or from philanthropy. 
So philanthropy is providing aid, right? It's great support for a couple of years. You can send your kid into school, you might receive some books, but it's not sustainable. It's not going to help a family to develop independently. That's the difference to impact investing, where you provide money. The money needs to be paid back. That's an important system about that. And it's not only about because you want to make money as an investor, but it's psychologically totally important that the individual knows it's a business relationship and it's an opportunity to basically develop financially and economically. And obviously, by providing a loan, you're also sure that you can guarantee that there's a social impact. You do not want that the money spent to buy a TV um, or a car, but you want to make sure the money is spent for the right cause. So you start to measure the social impact. You start to understand um, if jobs are created, if uh, kids are in a better health, if children can go to school and educate. That's what you measure, that's what impact investing is about. The company I'm very proud, I'm representing together with you know, great staff working all over the world, with ambassadors, with board members, but also with investors, some of them also from Switzerland. What we have been doing over the last 15 years, we basically have deployed 3.5 billion into over 60 countries, and we are touching about 30 million individuals as we speak today. Blue Orchard is providing every eight seconds alone, and by the end of my little speech, we will have deployed and granted 150 loans to individual people who would not have had any access to funding. These are crazy numbers, I'm fully aware of that, but it's big data, and that's also the message I want to convey with you. It is small money, but if you multiply small money, and if you're sure that there's a social impact, it's small money, big impact. And I really mean big impact. The examples I'm showing you all know the people personally. George is living in Tbilisi. George has received the first loan three and a half years ago in order to build up his little grocery store. Now he's planning to expand. He actually wants to open up a coffee shop. He's an extreme happy individual today, and he's running his own business. He would have had no chance whatever to start a business without receiving an initial loan three and a half years ago. Carmen is running a restaurant in Guatemala. When I met Carmen the first time, she was a beggar. Uh, the first loan she took was $50. The $50 she invested in buying some pans and, uh, and plates. She started to cook some food at her home and started to sell it on the local market. Today, three loan cycles later, Carmen is one of the proudest women I probably have met because she's an entrepreneur, she runs her own restaurant, her daughters are at university, she employs four people in the restaurant, and when I asked her last time what her plan was, she asked, she's going to apply for next loan, because she's planning to open up two more restaurants. And that is what I basically mean when talking to individuals, right? This is not aid, but you basically accelerate and you help an individual to create your own fortune and your own future. And that's the beauty about really providing some access to capital. And it is access. If you provide food, it will go nowhere. If you provide books, it will go nowhere. You need to provide capital in order to really develop individuals, and they are looking for it. I want to give you an example from an investment perspective, because there are always two sides. On the one side, it's the individual re being receiving funding. On the other side, it's the investor. Take an example, you provide one million US dollars over a period of five years. The average loan in our company for the last 16 years is 1,000 US dollars in average. The duration of a loan cycle in average is only 12 months. So loans are being paid back already after 12 months. If you basically provide one million for five years, you are going to reach out to over 55,000 individuals because you can recycle the money and every single loan reaches out to at least 10 to 15 members and friends within the family. These are World Bank figures. So think about that. One million dollar in five years touches and increases the life of over 55,000 individuals. 
On the other side, an investor would basically receive returns because there's interest rate related to the, to the loan. Over the last 16 years, we have provided on an annual rate 4% return, which in the current low-yield environment, obviously, is also a fantastic investment, but that's not the cause. But it just shows you it's a business. Over 16 years, the default rate with 30 million loans has been lower than 1%, which is absolutely astonishing. This is lower than you know, any bank would give you figures here in Western Europe. The reason why the default rate is so low, it is all related to pride and dignity. If you are an individual and you get a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get access to capital, you will make everything happen to repay that loan. So you're going to invest it in whatever cause you have been granted the money for. And lastly, obviously, you also have got a substantial environmental impact. We call these three factors, we call them triple bottom line impact. Who is actually the recipient of the money? Women play an important role in providing microloans. The overall average is roughly 60%. And I want to run you one example here. We made a lot of research. If you have got a male and a female, and both are coming from the similar background, and both of them would be granted $1,000, what is happening in most of the cases, the recipient is going to be approached by a friend, by a colleague, and he would ask him if he would be willing to provide some of this, uh, of this loan in order to double the loan. So physically what happens, a colleague would come and give me the money, I'll double it by tomorrow. Now, research shows that the women, the female, would be responsive in 3% of the cases, and the male, believe it or not, will be responsive in about 27% of the cases, which is totally mind-blowing, and it's all over the world the same picture. It's the same picture as well in here. It's something you might want to think about on the weekend. That's the reason why women have a very different risk understanding than men have. The cause remains the same. Also, the man wants to protect and wants to help his children, but he's got a different way of looking at risks. There are several activities beside microfinance where you can basically help and improve. It's about renewable energy, it's about education, it's about providing insurance coverage. You can empower women. So microfinance has developed into all kinds of different topics and areas, and is today, you wouldn't believe it, it's the fastest growing asset class in the world. The growth rate is about 30 to 40 percent, and that's beautiful because the money being pumped into the system is really helping and is reducing poverty dramatically. That's the last picture I want to show you. I came back five days ago from Cambodia, and this is Anna Sui, I've been knowing her for several years. When I met her first, she was really a beggar. She's living at two hours out of Siam Rep, in an agricultural area, and she had nothing. And she asked for a loan for $50 to buy a couple of hens, because she wanted to sell out the eggs in the neighborhood. So she was given the first $50, together with a one-day training session on some basic accounting standards, just that she would know and understand what is a margin and what is the price of an egg she's going to ask for. Now, three loan cycles later, she basically has opened a total new world. She has employed her entire family, her friends are working for her. It's a small and mid-sized company with over 15 people working for her. In the back, you see a couple of hens and ducks. It's difficult to see. She's got 2,500 ducks, and I think about 8,000 hens. And anybody of you who potentially you know, will be somewhere in a hotel close to Siam Rep and have a breakfast egg, that is most likely going to become from her farm. And the amazing thing is, And the amazing thing is, she's making profits on a monthly basis of over 1,000 US dollars today. And the average income in Cambodia today per month is $80. She has become one of the most, I wouldn't call it wealthiest, 
but successful businesswoman in the area. And now she's starting to help, she's starting to employ other people. So it's very small money initially, but the impact is phenomenal. And I would all like to ask you to participate in helping to include excluded. There are 2.3 billion colleagues and friends and families out there. They want to be part of our system. We can all help. We can help with very small money. The impact is phenomenal. Thank you very much.